Good morning. Um, what, uh, my name is Jessica. I don't do this very often, so I get pretty nervous. Uh, so, uh, actually, would you stand with me in reverence for the reading of the Holy Scriptures? <laughs> okay. Um, it's from John 11, 70 through 44. Now, when Jesus came, he found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb for four days. Bethany was near Jerusalem, about two miles off, and many of the Jews had, had come to Martha and Mary to console them concerning their brother. So when Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went and met him, but Mary remained seated in the house. Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But even now, I know that whatever you ask from God, God will give you. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha said to him, I know, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection on the last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet he live. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? She said to him, Yes, Lord, I believe that you are Christ, the Son of God, who is coming into the world. When she had said this, she went and called to her sister Mary, saying in private, The Lord is here and is calling you. And when she heard it, she rose quickly and went to him. Now Jesus had not yet come into the village, but was still in the place where Martha had met him. When the Jews who were with her in the house, consoling her, saw Mary rise quickly and go out, they followed her, supposing that she was going to the tomb to weep there. Now when Mary came to her, now when Mary came to where Jesus was and saw him, she fell at his feet, saying to him, Lord, if you had been there, my brother would not have died. When Jesus saw her weeping, and the Jews who had come with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in her spirit and greatly troubled. And he said, where have you laid him? They said to him, Lord, come and see. And Jesus wept. So the Jews said, see how he loved him? But some of them said, could not he have opened the eyes of the blind man and also kept this man from dying? Then Jesus, deeply moved again, came to the tomb. It was a cave and a stone lay against it. Jesus said, take away the stone. Martha, the sister of the dead man, said to him, Lord, by this time there, there will be an odor, for he has been dead for four days. Jesus said to her, did I not tell you that if you believe, you would see the glory of God? So they took the stone and Jesus lifted up his eyes and said, Father, I thank you that you, Father, I thank you that you have that we may believe that you sent me. When he said these things, he cried out with a loud voice, Lazarus, Lazarus, come out. The man who had died came out, his hands and feet bound with linen strips and his face wrapped with a cloth. Jesus said to them, unbind him and let him go. This is the word of the Lord. You may be seated. Thank you so much, Jessica. Wonderful job. Well, um, like I said earlier, my name's Cameron, one of the pastors here. Super good to be with you all. Um, and we are taking a break from the gospel according to Mark. We started Mark last February, I think it was. So over a year ago, and we've, you know, we've, we, we take breaks periodically to jump into something else. Uh, we will take more breaks over the course of Mark. We've made it about halfway through Mark, just over, uh, in about a year's time. Uh, and we'll continue, but, but it's Easter time. So we need to take a little break um, and do something else. And so for the next, next three weeks, this week, two more, uh, we are kind of in a, in a Lent, Holy Week, Easter miniseries here. And Lent, I don't know how much, how much you know about Lent. Lent is something that uh, certainly other Christian traditions, uh, apart from non-denominational Protestantism, kind of take a lot more seriously and have a lot more familiarity and history with. 
Uh, but Lent has historically been a time of reflecting on human mortality. Um, of course, that human mortality in light of our relationship with Jesus. And of course, in light of the hope that we have in him and all that he's accomplished, including the raising from the dead. Um, but Lent is a good time to reflect on the fact that as Josh White would always say, I don't know if this was a quote he got from somebody else or whatever, but the death rate seems to be one per person. It just uh, pretty much shakes out that way, doesn't it? And that raises the question, how are we supposed to think about death? If, if death is something that comes for everyone, uh, how ought we to think about it? If you were to ask 100 random people from across the U.S., you very well could get 100 different nuances of answers. Um, is death something that's natural? You just kind of, oh yeah, there's a natural and, you know, the natural way of things. Or is it unnatural? Is death good or is death bad? Is death to be avoided at all costs or is death to be embraced? What lies on the other side of death? What lies before it, for that matter? Dylan Thomas's important poem, first published in 1951, Do Not Go Gentle Into That Good Night. It, it's kind of achieved a level of popularity that's kind of rare for poetry. I'm guessing most of you have heard at least a portion of that poem. Uh, if you ever, the thing I remember most recently is the movie Interstellar. Anybody see that? You just got like Michael Caine reading that poem. I felt like 15 times in that movie. I was like, this is a lot of Dylan Thomas in outer space. And I assure you, coming from my mouth, it will not sound nearly as poetic as coming from Michael Caine's glorious glorious accent, but I'm going to give it a go. Listen to this poem. Dylan Thomas, do not go gentle into that good night. Do not go gentle into that good night. Old age should burn and rave at close of day. Rage, rage against the dying of the light. Though wise men at their end no dark is right, because their words had forked no lightning, they do not go gentle into that good night. Good men, the last wave by, crying how bright. Their frail deeds might have danced in a green bay. Rage, rage against the dying of the light. Wild men who caught and sang the sun in flight and learned too late, they grieved it on its way. Do not go gentle into that good night. Grave men near death who see with blinding sight. Blind eyes could blaze like meteors and be gay. Rage, rage against the dying of the light. And you, my father, there on the sad height, curse, bless me now with your fierce tears, I pray. Do not go gentle into that good night. Rage, rage against the dying of the light. Thomas's poem captures something that that kid is very well aware of. Seriously, that's beautiful. That we Christians can and should readily affirm that death is an enemy. You can think of it as all kinds, yes, you could talk about it as natural, of course, everything dies, we all die. But fundamentally, the Christian view of things is that death is an enemy. In today's passage, Jesus is going to give us an absolutely crucial example and teaching for how we ought to encounter this enemy as we move about our lives. It surprised me as I dove into this passage, really for the first time with any depth, I think it'll surprise you too. So let's pray one more time. Invite the Spirit to open our spirits to the truth of his word. Father, as we open up this scripture, um, we pray that we'd receive it humbly, with open arms, open hearts, open minds, open spirits, Lord. Speak to us. Lord, as a result of encountering your word today, may we be changed, may we be different. May we walk out of this place a little bit more like you than we were when we came in. Help us. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, the story was read for you, and we're going to break it up into three parts as we kind of look at it. The story actually continues uh, in the first part of John chapter 11, we picked up in verse 17, but you get some, some, some helpful context there if you want to go back and read it later. Um, but we read about this, this man named Lazarus. 
There's a man named Lazarus who's died, and he's the brother of two women named Mary and Martha. There are a couple of stories about them uh, in the New Testament. This is the first time this family, these three siblings, Lazarus, Mary, and Martha, are mentioned in John. So it's John's introduction to them. But we get these little clues as we read the story that, that Jesus had an especially close relationship with this family. Did you know that Jesus had friends? Like, <laughs> like I, I, I take it the 12 disciples were his friends, but it is interesting. Like, do you ever think about that? Oh, there's this other family. We don't really know anything about it, but immediately you get the sense from this passage, like, whoa, these are like Jesus's people. Like, he's especially concerned about them. They must have spent untold amount of time together. We don't know how much, but uh, Jesus had friends that weren't just his work buddies. <laughs> But Lazarus had died. Lazarus had died. And he'd been in a tomb for four days. And so they probably put him in a, a natural cave. They rolled the stone over it, a, a, a disc-shaped stone. And then the family had probably done what most Jews did at this time. The standard practice was to spend the first week of significant grief sitting on the floor of their home as friends come to visit you, often just sitting silently, the ministry of presence. They may have hired some professional mourners to come and to weep with them. There may have been a few musicians as well. So it talks about the Jews in this passage. That's, that's this crowd that would have been there to help them in their grief as they're mourning. These, these two sisters are mourning their brother. We don't know what illness uh, Lazarus had suffered from. Could have been anything. But, but presumably, the picture we get is that these two sisters had been nursing him for how long, we're not sure. For long, how long, we're not sure. How long had he been sick before they knew, oh my gosh, this is, this is going south. We need to let Jesus know. We're just not sure. John doesn't tell us. But the image is these two sisters caring for their brother up until the point of his death. And uh, earlier in the story, we, we get that they had sent a messenger to go find Jesus. Jesus was out doing ministry, and they, they sent someone to go tell Jesus, hey, Lazarus is about to die. Essentially, he's on his death bed. And you can imagine these sisters knowing Jesus, knowing Jesus loves them, he cares for them personally, probably believing he's powerful to do something about this. And they sin for him. And we didn't read the, this part of the story, but Jesus essentially says, like, I, well, it's not time to go just yet. We're going to wait just a little bit longer. And he assures everyone, uh, this is not going to be final. He's, he's going to fall asleep, but he's not going to die. And he clarifies, what I mean is, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to help him. He's not going to be dead for long. He's going to be raised back to life. But from the perspective of these sisters, just imagine you're watching your brother die, you're caring for him, you're nursing him, and you're throwing this message out to Jesus, hoping he can just come back in time, and Jesus misses. He doesn't make it back. He doesn't come. Hopes are dashed. Does Jesus care? Why wouldn't he help us? So that's where we pick up in this story. And we see, let's see, do we have the scripture? There should be three sections. I'm, did it get dropped from the slideshow? There we go, that one. So Jesus comes up, and Martha heard that Jesus was coming. She goes up, she, catch, she runs out to see Jesus. Mary stays back in the house. And this, these interactions are, are really powerful. Mary, Martha starts with this, Lord, if you had been there, my brother wouldn't have died. But even now, I know that whatever you ask from God, God will give you. And that's a complex response from Martha. Like, you, I think what you see there is, is she's trying to maintain hope in her disappointment. She voices it. Jesus, why didn't you come? If you had been here, this wouldn't have happened. You could have done something about this. So she hasn't given up on Jesus necessarily, but she's, she's rebuking him. Like, why didn't you come? Why did you leave our family hanging? But then she follows that up with, but I know, whatever you ask for God, from God, God will give you. And maybe that even stings a little bit more for Martha, you know? Like she affirms, I know you could have prevented this, and you didn't, and I know you could have. I know you could have, and you didn't. You see that? Jesus responds, Jesus responds, your brother will rise again. Your brother will rise again. 
So they're in this agony of waiting on Jesus. Jesus responds, your brother is going to rise again. And this is a beautiful promise. This is a promise that actually is extended for, to all people toward your deceased loved ones who are in Christ. They will rise again. When Mar Martha hears that, and she, she's a pretty savvy theologian from the looks of it. Martha connects this promise to, to this general promise that all the Jews had, or most of the Jews had, that there was going to be this day coming when there's going to be a resurrection. She says, I know he's going to rise again. On the last day, there's going to be a resurrection. Yeah, I know this. That's right. I believe that. I trust that. And that's correct. She said, she's speaking the truth. But then Jesus responds. Love this dialogue. He says, okay, yeah, that's right. But I am the resurrection and the life. Jesus is saying, you are right to hope for that day, the day of the Lord, the day that's coming when God is going to raise his people up to newness of life. Death will not have the last say. That day is coming. You're right. Lazarus will get to be a part of that. But he's saying, but what you don't see is that I am the reason and I am the avenue through which anyone will be raised to life. You want to know how all that stuff is going to work out right here? It's through me. In John's gospel, he arranges it so that there's these seven I am statements that use the Greek phrase, ego I me, um, I am. And it's meant to make you think about that great Old Testament declaration. Who is God? I am. And Jesus supplies seven times a, a second clause to that. I am, in this case, this is his fifth statement, the resurrection and the life. And then he's, he connects it to belief. He says, look, I'm the resurrection and the life. You know what that means? If you believe in me, even though you die, death doesn't get the last say. You shall live yet. And if you live and believe in me, you shall never die. There's a kind of life that can never be taken from you. And he says, do you what? Believe. So he crucially connects this claim about himself to this idea of belief. And he points it right to her. Do you believe this? Do you think this is true? I'm saying some wild stuff to you, Martha. But do you believe this? Final part of the dialogue here. She says, yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Christ, you're the anointed Messiah King. We've talked about that concept a lot through our time in Mark. She says, I believe you're the Christ. She says, you're the son of God who is coming into the world. So she's even acknowledging there his pre-existence, that Jesus is this pre-existent figure who wasn't, Jesus didn't come into existence when he was born in the manger. He has existed as God, as the son of God from eternity past, and he has come into the world. So there we go. So to sum all this up, Jesus has this first encounter with this, with this sister, Martha. And it's this truth encounter. It's a truth exchange. It's a debate a little bit. And Jesus meets her right where she's at. She starts asking questions. I know that you could have done this. Yes, but he's going to rise again. She says, well, I know he's going to rise again, but, you know, what about right now? He says, well, look, I am the resurrection and the life. She says, do you believe this? Yes, I do believe so he confronts Martha in her grief, I think with what she needed in this moment, which was with truth. This was with truth. And we keep reading. So the next section says, when she had said this, she went, she called her sister Mary, saying in private, the teacher is here, that's Jesus, and he's calling for you. So we see Jesus must have been asking, so where, where's Mary? I want to speak with her. So Martha goes and gets her. She comes. She quickly went to him still in the place where Martha had met him outside the village. And when the Jews who were with her were in the house, they were consoling her, they saw her quickly rise and go out, and they followed her, supposing that she was going to the tomb to weep, and they were going to go weep with her. But then what happens? She came to where Jesus was, and she saw him, and she fell at his feet. She fell at his feet, and she said to him the same thing her sister had just said. Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. And that's where she leaves it. So she doesn't go off into theological debate. She doesn't press the issue further. She just says it. 
And we see that she was crying as she said this. And Jesus saw that she was crying as she said this. Notice Jesus' response. There are a few aspects of Jesus' response now to Mary. First, just the seeing and noticing. He doesn't jump into theological discussion with her. He doesn't repeat the same conversation, even though it started out the same way. We see that he notices what's going on. John tells us Jesus took notice of her weeping. He took notice of her tears and the other mourners' tears. He saw the situation for what it was, and it was a little bit different. But second, it tells us that Jesus was deeply moved in his spirit and greatly troubled. And this is interesting. The English translations here are basically universally hesitant to translate this phrase in in the ways that, that I think are better and most capture what's going on here. It's almost as if most of the English translators are a little bit embarrassed because this phrase, deeply moved, deeply moved in his spirit. It does, like When you read this, you're like, oh, so Jesus was sad too. I think he was sad. We're going to get to that. But that phrase is never anywhere else used to talk about like interior sadness. This phrase, this word, is used to talk about seething anger. Well, that's weird. The word for deeply move typically carries the idea of this spitting, fuming, grunting anger. Why? What is going on? At first, that sounds like if they, if, if they had just translated that way, uh, which I think they, they should have, uh, but you would read that and you would go, whoa, what is going on here? It might seem strange. It might just seem outright cruel. Like, Jesus, what? Oh, got a mourning sister here. What are you doing? Is he angry with Mary and her tears? Some of us, <laughs> growing up in the church, we might assume that that's what Jesus is doing here because that's what Christians have done to us our whole lives. Oh, you're crying. Suck it up. Get it together. If you had enough faith, you wouldn't be wrecked like this. Man up, woman up, whatever. Get it together. We don't cry here. Don't you really believe Jesus who he says he is? Maybe Jesus is angry that they don't have enough faith not to grieve over their brother. But I say no. I say no. I don't think so. John makes it clear that whatever his anger looked like here, it did not look like a lack of compassion for Lazarus and Mary and Martha as the crowd remarks, wow, look how Jesus loved him. What I submit to you is that what we see here in Jesus is the righteous, perfect, pure anger of God at death. At death. Sometimes anger is the only right and just response to something. And I don't want to belabor that. I may have if we hadn't had last week's sermon, if you heard that, talking about the judgment of God. And and really, if we can turn it just the right way, we see that like the anger of God is his love for people violated. It's his love. It's his protective impulse to say here and no further. Can you harm my image bearers, the ones I love? So we're not going to belabor that here, but I only say sometimes anger is the only right and just response. It is the only right and just response when you see evil and injustice, when you see the cosmic horror of death. Anger is right. And with that, we just, we we said it before, we'll say it again, Christianity is not uh, a religion that is skeptical of emotion, okay? Sometimes it's portrayed that way, and that's a bummer. Because God created our spirits, our minds, our bodies to emote. And that's, those are good and natural responses to things that happen in this world, both the good and the bad, positive emotion, negative emotion. They tell us something serious is worth paying attention to, either to celebrate or to grieve or to fight or whatever. Can people be overly led astray by emotions? Of course. Our emotions are are the final arbiter of truth? Of course not. Of course not. But God made you and me to feel. To feel. Just as he does. Just as the perfect son of God 
feels. That's how we were made. It's good. So are you angry at death? There are people in our church right now who are brushing up against it, either in their loved ones or themselves personally. Gosh, coincidentally, my uncle, my mom's brother, just passed away uh, two nights ago, three nights ago, after a long, drawn-out battle with cancer. It touches all of us. And if it hasn't yet, I don't mean to be morbid, but that's a bummer because that probably means there's going to be a, more of a stacking of experiencing of these things. It comes for us all first, often for our friends and family, and then for us. Are you angry at death? You can be. You should be. You should be. Lent has been a time to reflect on our mortality, and may we recognize the sadness and wrongness of, may we not have a pious posture, like, oh, yes, that's the natural way of things. May we rage against it, as Jesus does right here. You know why Jesus hates death? Because he loves the people that he's made. He loves them. And this is not the way it was supposed to be. I would, probably, I would submit that really the only way that we can really recognize and lean into and embrace the sadness and the wrongness and the horror of death is if we actually have firm confidence that Jesus really has conquered it. Because if we don't believe that, if this stuff's all a fairy tale, and I know many of us you know, struggle to believe some days more than others, but if this stuff is just a fairy tale and death really does get the last word, this life is a nightmare. And I wouldn't recommend anybody look too deeply at it, but if there is a God who has defeated death by taking it into himself, yeah. Amen. Then we can afford to look at it and anger over it and rage at it and celebrate the king who's had victory over it. So, Jesus is angry. He's angry. But there's one more thing we see here. The shortest verse in the Bible, that little Bible trivia quiz we all know. If you, can't, if you, never, if you don't memorize scripture, you can always memorize this one. <laughs> you can always memorize this one. John eleven thirty five. 35. Jesus wept. Jesus asked, where have you laid him? They said, come and see. And Jesus weeps. Jesus cries. The Son of God in human flesh, his tear ducts well up, and he cries. Jesus experienced a depth of emotional grief that spilled out through his body in tears. And this is an incredibly important moment to understand the compassion, the empathy, the sympathy, the sensitivity of this king we claim to follow. Because the whole time, Jesus, Jesus knows, he's already declared earlier in John 11, R Lazarus is not dead here. Lazarus is coming back from the dead. Lazarus will live through this episode. Jesus knows that. The whole time, he knows he has the power to raise Lazarus, not just the power, but the intention to do it. He knew that he was going to raise Lazarus from the dead. And he knew, in fact, that this was ultimately going to strengthen the faith of this family and display his glory in ways that would not have been able to happen if this whole episode hadn't been able to play out. He knows all that. But Jesus does not minimize their pain. Nonetheless, he does not minimize their pain, nor did he protect himself from experiencing his own pain. He just leans fully into the thing and lets it be what it is, which is a horror and a grief and a nightmare. And Jesus wept. His sovereignty, his foreknowledge, they do not minimize his intimacy with the people that he loves and their suffering. He's a savior who shares in your pain. Sometimes, maybe most times, people in deep pain just need someone to share that pain with them. 
In the words of the Apostle Paul, someone to weep with those who weep. We've all experienced the horror of someone of being in deep pain and someone meeting it with a platitude, meeting it with dismissal, meeting it with, uh, you know, have you thought about it this way? Or have you tried this? Or what about this? Or, oh, it's not that big of a deal. Or don't you know Jesus has done this? We've all experienced that, I, I assume. Jesus doesn't do that. Jesus doesn't do that. When you think about Jesus, when you pray to God, do you think about this? Is this the kind of God that you pray to? When you're at your lowest moments, when, when the weight of the world is heaviest on your back, when you've lost the most important thing, because one day, one, one day sooner or later, each of us are going to have the hardest day of our lives, you know? Like, one of them's going to be it. I don't know when that's going to be. But in those moments, do you trust that this is who our God is? The one who weeps with you. Even though he's got all the power, even though he's got all the answers, even though there is a reason for why these things happen, even though the, all of that, even though Jesus wept. Is that the God that you pray to? Is that the God that you let come close at your lowest moments? That's who Jesus is. So Jesus concludes this conversation with Mary. And then before it's over, the Jews comment. We referenced this earlier. The Jews said, look, see how he loved him. Jesus' love for Lazarus is so clear through how he's caring for Lazarus' sisters in this moment. And Jesus' own grief being displayed for all to see. But quite naturally, verse 37, some of them said, that wasn't the first impression everyone got from this episode. Some of them said, could not he who opened the eyes of the blind man also have kept this man from dying? It's a natural question to ask. I assume all of us have asked that at some point. I'll just leave that there. Then we read on the last section. So Jesus, deeply moved, rather angry, <laughs> again, came to the tomb. It was a cave. There was a stone that laid against it. Jesus said, take away the stone. Martha spoke up for everyone when she said, are you sure about this, Jesus? Four days, a body decomposing in a tomb, four days is not something you want to see. Terrific. The visceral, gory reality of death laid out for all to see here. The grim, disgusting reality had time to fully set in. You know, and there wasn't, <laughs> there, they basically just treated, treated bodies for smell and wrapped them in some loose linens. There, it wasn't like our, you know, sometimes we can import our cultural setting, often you go, you open casket, you see like someone who's you know, presented in a way, a body that's presented in a way that looks very humane and very peaceful, and that's, that's fine. This wasn't that. This would have smelled. This would have smelled. And we can leave that there. There was nothing for them, or so they thought, in this cave to be found from rolling away the stone, except for rotting flesh and fresh trauma for these sisters, Right? Jesus, are you kidding me? You're going to make us look at this? Smell this from this brother that we love? But Jesus answers, verse 40, Did I not tell you, if you believed, you would see the glory of God? And he's saying here, he's making it clear, he, does, he didn't just mean in the far off day, the day of the Lord, the resurrection that all good Jews hoped for. He means today. Right now, he's going to do something incredibly special. So he prays, and it's interesting, this prayer, we often think this is kind of a, a bad thing or a suspect thing, but he, he prays for the benefit of those around him. 
I knew that you always hear me, but I said this on account of the people standing around, that they may believe that you sent me. So Jesus doesn't want the crowd to miss that, that, that what he's about to do with Lazarus is not some parlor trick. It's not through some kind of sorcery or magic. It's not through a pagan ritual. It's not through anything, but through his connection to the living God. And for them to see and believe that Jesus was actually sent by that God. So with a simple command after this prayer, letting everyone know exactly what's going on, he says, Lazarus, come out. And this is the third of, this is the third of three stories in the Gospels, three, three, three accounts that are recorded of Jesus raising people from the dead. This is the third, the third one. And it's the most dramatic sign of Jesus' identity, his power, and his authority in John. You know, we were talking about Mark, how the book is kind of arranged to, 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 to put the, the transfiguration story where Jesus takes the disciples up on the mountain and he's transfigured, his glory shones bright, he's shining brightly, it's like crazy, his, his clothes turn white, and it's like the divine glory shining through. They finally get to see Jesus for who he is, and they, they, they worship him. And the booming voice of God comes down and it says, hey, this is my son, listen to him. That's the climax of Mark. That's where the disciples get all of that. But interestingly, John doesn't even include the transfiguration story in his gospel. Doesn't mean it didn't happen. That doesn't mean John didn't think that the transfiguration happened. John was there, actually. But in how he's arranged it, he sets this miracle up to be, in in the narrative structure of John, the turning point, where it's like cards on the table, he, Jesus has done some amazing things. He's healed a, bl- a man born blind. He's given a paralytic back their function. But now, cards on the table. Who is he? I am the resurrection and the life. I am the resurrection and the life. The greatest miracle someone could perform. And this is the miracle, coincidentally, that got Jesus in huge trouble immediately after so that the Jewish leadership sought to kill him. So next week when we read about Palm Sunday, the Palm Sunday story, death has been declared. Jesus is going down. It's just a matter of time. And this was the tipping point where many of the Jews said, it's it's over. We're done with this guy. We're done with this guy because they were so scandalized by his power and his favor amongst the people. And here in this miracle, you know, it's one thing for Jesus to say, hey, I'm the resurrection of the life. I could claim that to you. I could get up here. I could say whatever. And if you know me, you would just laugh, laugh me off. You'd say, Cameron's an idiot. <laughs> Maybe you would want to dismiss Jesus as an idiot. What are you talking about? And then with the mere words, he says, Lazarus, come out. The man who'd been dead four days takes up his life again, walks out of the tomb, and I even just love this little, the last line here in the story, Jesus said to them, unbind him and let him go. It's like when Jesus raised Jairus' daughter, we read about that in Mark, and he says, hey, give her some food. Jesus' first impulse in these amazing, amazing moments is not to lose sight of the needs of this person. Let, get, get rid of these cloths so he can go free. Let him move unhindered. Unbind him. Let him go. Jesus cares about Lazarus. So it's one thing to claim it. It's another thing to do it. He is the resurrection and the life. And that's the story. That's the story. Like these sisters, Mary and Martha, we too, obviously, find ourselves in a broken, sin and death-stained world where loss and grief are always around the corner. I'll say it again, if you haven't encountered significant grief in your life, that's, that's good, that's great. I don't want any of us to grieve, of course. But I just say, it's coming, it's coming. It's part of the deal of living in this world. Also like these sisters, we too, we have promises from Jesus of a glorious future where Jesus raises the dead. If Jesus is the resurrection and the life, we can take it to the bank. You know, this is an interesting story because uh, this kind of resurrection that Lazarus experienced 
It's not the same kind that Jesus experienced or that you and I are going to experience one day, or Lazarus will experience again one day. Some people want to, you know, nuance the terminology and say this is more like a resuscitation. Yes, he was really dead, but he was raised back to this mortal life. Lazarus, this is kind of a bummer. Lazarus was going to have to die again. <laughs> That's kind of a bummer. He was going to have to die again. We don't know when he died, but he did. He did. This was just a, ra- a re-raising to natural life. And this is something that's not promised to all of us. This is a sign of confirming who Jesus is and what he has the power to do. But nonetheless, we have a glorious future promise where Jesus is going to raise the dead. We get to be a part of that. And like these sisters, we get to enjoy, <laughs> say that facetiously, this muddy middle where we have to wait to see it. I'm struck by the arrangement of the story where the declaration of I am the way, I am the, the resurrection and the life, but then grief and tears and sadness and stench waiting. And then resurrection. We're all living in that muddy middle where we have to wait. Like Lazarus, we too are dead. We're dead in two senses. The Bible declares we are dead in our sins. We are dead in our sins. We're dead to God, dead to righteousness, unable to save ourselves. We're dead in our sins, and part of that, part and parcel with that, is that we are facing down our own physical deaths. We're mortal. I don't live like it. The reality of my impending death, I hope it's a long time from now, but whenever it's coming, it doesn't factor mostly into my day-to-day decision-making. I guess it does when I put on my seatbelt. But we easily, easily forget it's coming for us too until we're forced to reckon with this reality, usually in very, very hard, very cruel ways. So like Lazarus, we're dead. Like Lazarus, we too will be raised to new life through trust in Jesus. Death is real. It's an enemy. It's a horror. But if you've trusted Jesus, one day, like Lazarus, you will hear this voice. You will hear this voice. It'll say, Vivian, come out. Yeah, Luis, it's going to say, come out. It. Jesus is going to say that. Kyle. Come out. We will hear the voice of the resurrection and the life who will, with the simple power of his word, call us up into a life everlasting with the flesh that looks like our, you look at Jesus' resurrection body, it's strange. He has nail holes, but he's like perfected. He's glorified. He's glorious. Paul tells us that's what it's going to be like for us. And we can't speculate too much about all the nitty-gritty details, but trust me, it's good. And it's beautiful. We will each hear the voice of our Savior if we've trusted him, if we've bent the knee to him that says, you come out, back to life. And I was always like to say, not what we often insert, like, oh, disembodied, heavenly, cloudy, like, a, I don't know, you're transformed into a baby with a harp on a cloud kind of thing. Don't know where that imagery came from. It's life with the king in a resurrected, recreated, perfected, restored new heavens and new earth with things to do, a God to worship, friendships to maintain, an eternity to explore. People, that I, you know, I get, so many of us get minutes with one another in the scheme of a 60, 70 year life. There will be endless time for God's people to know and enjoy one another and our Savior. That day when we hear that voice, come out. It will be the greatest day you've ever known. It will be the greatest day I've ever known. And we will, it will only get more glorious from there. So death is real. It's a horror. We should rage against it. Like Dylan Thomas. But what he doesn't know is that there's a God There is a God who has raged against it on our behalf, and he did that by taking it into himself, by being victim to it, by being slain on a Roman cross, but raising again to new life. 
and he was glorified, and he sits at the right hand of the Father, and he's coming back. Do you believe? That's the question, the most important question this passage leaves us with. Do you believe? If not, I ask you why. If yes, we should worship. We should worship. Amen? All right, let's pray.